Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to address the question of where the piano, the grand piano specifically, got its shape. And we're talking about this familiar curved shape that I'm sure all of you have seen. Now, the first clue as to where this shape comes from, it comes from realizing that the piano is actually a stringed instrument. So when you hit a key on the piano keyboard, it sets a hammer in motion and the hammer strikes a string. If you've ever opened up a piano, you know that it has many, many different strings inside it. Uh, the string then vibrates and uh, transfers its vibration energy to the soundboard and the soundboard radiates it to, to the room that you're in. So basically, that's how the piano works. You know, like many other instruments, like a guitar, uh, like a harp, I've put a picture of a harp here. And which is actually particularly interesting because the harp has this shape which is kind of like a piano, although it's not really related it's for, for different reasons. So <clears throat> the piano has 88 keys and each key produces a different pitch. Now to control this pitch, uh, basically what you want to do is be able to control the frequency of the string that is associated with the key. So each key has a string or multiple strings that it that uh, uh, produce its sound and you want to be able to build a piano such that the different strings associated with diff different keys uh, vibrate at the different frequencies now there are three main ways in which you can control the frequency of a string and i've put a picture of a guitar here because it's easier to uh, sort of grasp these uh, concepts using a guitar and these three ways are by you can change the frequency of a string by varying the tension of the string, the mass or density of the string, and the length of the string. Uh, and we can demonstrate this very easily, again, as I've said, using a guitar. So I've prepared in advance uh, an electric guitar. I have it here with me. So I'll just pick it off uh, its stand. And you can see it here. And let's go through each of these things uh, separately. So let's start with tension. Now, the more tension we uh, put on a string, the higher its frequency will go. And, <clears throat> you know, the guitar has these tuning pegs here on the side, and they can be used to increase or decrease the tension. And you can immediately hear, as I do this, the change in the pitch or the frequency of the string. Here's this high open E. And here's this tuning peg that uh, controls the tension of this high open E string. And I can decrease the tension. And you can hear the frequency going down. So that's one way. The second way is by controlling the mass of the string. Now, this is a little bit more difficult to demonstrate, but looking at this guitar you'll notice that the lowest most uh, strings notes the open e on the bottom uh, followed by the open a uh, open d g b and e are actually of different sizes or different weights so this string is the thickest then they become gradually thinner as you go up in frequency and this is not really a proof, but it sort of convinces you, I hope, that the lighter the string is, the higher its frequency. So the less mass you put on a string, the higher its frequency is going to become. The third way in which you can control the frequency is by controlling the length of vibrating string. And this is really how a guitar works, right? If you think about it, if I pluck this high open E string, which is now no longer an E string because I kind of put it out of tune. But if I pluck it and it's open, so and it vibrates, it has a particular frequency. And basically the entire string length vibrates. Now if I put my finger here at the middle of the string, this is the middle of the string, and I pluck it again, I've basically put it up one octave. And the reason I put it up one octave is really, when you think about it, when I hold it down here and I pluck it here, I only have half of the length of the string that is set into vibrational motion. So I've halved the length, 
and I've doubled the frequency. And I can continue shortening the length of the string and increasing the frequency. So these are the three the main ways in which you can control the frequency of a string. Now I'll put this guitar back. And now let's take our insights and try to apply them to the piano. So here's the piano keyboard and the frequency of the lowest most A here is 20, about 27 and a half hertz. And the rule is that each octave that you go up will uh, basically constitute doubling of the frequency of the string. So this low A here is going to be 27.5. The A an octave above it is going to uh, resonate at 55 hertz. The one above it at 110. The one above it at 220. The one above it at 440. Then 880, all the way up to about 3.3 uh, kilohertz. So th about 3300 hertz. And there are two extra keys here. So it's going to go even actually a little bit higher than 3320 hertz. So this is the range of frequencies that we have to create when building a piano. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the first uh, way, if we go back a slide, let's look at the first way in which you can control the frequency of a string. So we can vary its tension. Now, the way a piano is built, actually, the strings are already at maximal tension. Basically, each string in the piano uh, has a tension which is equivalent to about approximately 100 kilos, maybe a little less. And which is really a pretty amazing number. The, the strings are really thin, uh, but nevertheless they hold a significant weight or significant tension to them. And, and really the technology behind this is uh, really advanced in terms of materials. Uh, there's a lot of uh, thought put into building these very durable and powerful but thin steel uh, strings such that they don't break and they can carry this tension for many, many years and sustain many, many hammer. Uh, basically, <clears throat> you know, the hammers of the keys are going to strike them, I don't know how many thousands or tens of thousands of times throughout their life. And yet they can sustain this extremely well. Uh, a, a, an entire piano, by the way, has about 20,000 20, kilos of tension, approximately, uh, in it. So you can basically hang, I don't know how many cars, like uh, probably eight cars or something, uh, using the tension in the piano strings. So this is really, really, from an engineering point of view, uh, a really complex and demanding system, you know, the piano. Uh, just think about it, having to build something that can sustain this sort of tensions. But anyway, what, what I'm trying to say is that the strings are already wound at maximal tension, so we don't have any room to play around with uh, this parameter. Now, again, going back, we have two other ways of controlling the frequencies of the strings, used by varying their mass or their length. Let's go with the latter one, let's go with length. Let's say that we take a very really short string, about let's say 6.25 centimeters uh, for the A up here. Now, <clears throat> every time we want to double the, or every time we double the length of the string, we're going to have its frequency. So we can go down, so basically doubling the length brings you down one octave. So starting with 6.25, Going down one octave, uh, we're going to need a string which is about 12 centimeters long. Then going down another octave, a string which is 25 centimeters, and then half a meter, a meter, two meters, four meters, and eight meters. Now, of course, even if we start really small, we're going to end up with an unreasonably large piano, which is eight meters long. And nobody's going to buy this sort of piano. Of course, it's going to be extremely difficult to construct. And even if you construct it, where are you going to put it? Who has a living room which is eight me at least eight meters long? You'd actually want something bigger because you actually want to sit down uh, while you play the piano. So you want to have a room for a seat. So this idea starts out well, but it doesn't 
end well. So just varying the length of the string isn't going to really solve your problem. It's going to solve your problem for this initial part of the piano, from you know, dealing with the high frequencies. And really, this is why this shape here at the side of the piano and the upper, um, uh, and the upper frequency of the, of the piano looks the way it does. It's basically starting out with a short string and then increasing or doubling its length more or less as you go up until you reach a particular length about two or three meters beyond which you cannot go anymore. So you run out of space building the piano. But this explains this initial curve here. Now once you, re you reach this, <clears throat> this sort of wall, because you don't want to go past a two meter or three meter piano, you have to vary the string's mass instead if you want to control its frequency and you want to keep going down the, the piano range of frequencies. And this kind of explains why this part here is flat. But we still have to answer one more question, and that is why would you actually want to vary, why not vary the, the string's mass to begin with? Why not just have a completely flat piano with all of the strings having the same length and then just changing their mass as we go along? And the answer to this, the quick answer is that changing the mass isn't as good as changing the length. <clears throat> and let me explain why this is so. Or in other words, you would rather have thin, uh, very thin strings if you could do it or get away with it. Having to make them thicker to go down in, in frequency is actually a non-ideal solution. And so I'll explain why this is so. Now what you see here is I've basically taken the open A string on my guitar, which resonates or vibrates at 110 hertz, and I've recorded it, you know, I plugged it into my computer and I recorded it using my recording software. And on the left, you can see the waveform that resulted. So this is a waveform that was recorded for a few seconds and we can play it out. So the, what you see here on the left is basically the decaying sound of this guitar string as it's vibrating. Now using a particular uh, analysis software, which I'm not going to go into the details, but basically a software that does a mathematical operation called the Fourier transform, we can look at the frequency content of this guitar string audio. And what you can see is that when you look at it in the frequency domain, when you're asking what sort of vibrations is this decaying sound made of, you can see a large contribution from what we call the fundamental from 110 Hertz, which is the basic frequency of the string. But then what you also see are additional contributions at what appears to be equispaced uh, frequencies which are multiples of this fundamental frequency. So there's uh, contributions at 220 Hz, 330 Hz, 440 Hz, 550, 660, 770, and so on. They diminish as we go up in frequency. <clears throat> but the, the interesting thing is that they're all at multiples of the fundamental frequency. And we call the fundamental frequency a fundamental and the higher frequencies we call harmonics. Uh, and I'll call this entire thing a harmonic series. So there are these additional frequencies in the vibrating string, which are a multiple of the fundamental frequency, <clears throat> which make up its sound. <clears throat> now, let's look at a, a a case on the piano, say, where we want to play an, an A key, an, you know, an A note, which vibrates at 110 hertz, and we're going to create a, a sound which contains the fundamental frequency at 110, and then all of its mul multiples, you know, all of the harmonics, which are going to be multiples of the fundamental. And now, <clears throat> what we want to do is, let's ask ourselves what's going to happen when we add the A an octave above it. Now the A an octave above it is going to vibrate at the fundamental frequency which is twice uh, the frequency of the A below it. So if this A is at 110 Hertz, this A is going to vibrate at 220 Hertz. And it's going to have its own harmonic series which is going to be at multiples 
of 220. So it's going to have some contribution, you know, it's going to have the fundamental of 220, but it's also going to have a contribution from 440 hertz, 660 hertz, 880 hertz, and so forth and so forth. And you can see that this 220 and 220 overlap, and this 440 here and 440 overlap, and 660 and 60 overlap. And <clears throat> basically, this what this tells us is that the harmonic series of the A an octave above is going to overlap with the harmonic series of, with, of the A an octave below it. And they're going to really fall on the same frequency, which is a good thing, because our ear likes this sort of consonance. Now, this only applies to strings which are ideal, and by ideal I mean having no stiffness. And having no stiffness, basically, one way of having no stiffness is having no mass. The moment you start adding mass to a string, you're going to make it stiff, and that's going to bring you into a non-ideal uh, situation. And non-ideal strings, that is strings that have stiffness, actually have their harmonics deviate from multiples of the fundamental. And you can see it here on the right. And I've just made a, like an illustration. This is, of course, the numbers will depend on the exact string and mass and stiffness and so forth that you deal with. But now the harmonics of the low A are not going to be at 220, 330, 440, and so on, but they're going to be at slightly different frequencies, like 227, 325, 434, I just wrote some, you know, some random numbers, which are close to the reality, but not, you know, of course it will depend on the exact string. The same thing will also be true for the A, which is an octave above it, the 220 hertz A. So the fundamental is going to be at 220, but then the harmonics could be at like 448, 664, and you can see that they, the more non-ideal the strings are, the more stiff they are, and the more mass you want to add to them, the more they're going to deviate from these exact multiples. And once they deviate, and you try to play them together, you're going to get dissonance, because the harmonics don't line up. <clears throat> so, as a piano builder, what you'd like is to have strings which are as thin and massless as possible. Now, there are different ways of adding mass to a string. You don't have to actually make it thicker all the way, or, you know, every time. That's one way, but actually making it thicker, naively, really, really adds a lot to the stiffness. So that's a really bad way of increasing the mass of a string. What people actually do is they use wound strings. So they take a thin string and they sort of coil around it uh, a, a second string, which adds mass without really changing the stiffness that much. You can see this on guitar strings, by the way. Guitar strings, if you look at the thick, the, the low frequency strings, like the low E, the low A, uh, you'll see that they are actually wound strings. And if you open your piano and look inside, you'll also see that they have these uh, coily sort of things wrapped around the low strings that are there to add mass without adding a lot of stiffness. But regardless of the way you approach this, you're going to get uh, basically hit by the stiffness of the string. It's going to distort the perfect harmonics of your harmonic series. Uh, <clears throat> so going back with this additional insight that we have, we see why this shape comes about. You start out from the high frequencies using relatively uh, massless strings, strings that have that are very thin and they're not stiff at all, so you have these nice harmonics and you start increasing their length as you go down in frequency until you reach a point where the, they, they just require too much length that would result in too large a piano and at this point you use mass, which is not an ideal solution, but it is what it is. You know, you just have to use it and you have to live with the consequences. And this is also, by the way, why larger pianos, larger grand pianos, sound better than smaller grand pianos. Because larger grand pianos extend this length regime uh, farther out, so they don't have to pay a price by, or they have, I mean, they don't have to pay as large a price using the mass of the strings because they can stretch 
the use of length farther out before they have to resort to using mass. So that's very useful if you're, you know, if you want to get, if you're a purist and you want a, a nicer piano tone that is having harmonics which are exact multiples of the fundamental. And this is basically how or why the piano got its shape. Now I'll say a few words about upright pianos before concluding, and you might say at this point, well, you know, this is true for grand pianos, but if I look at my upright piano, it looks like a box. So it looks like the strings are all have the same, all have the same length. Uh, so what's going on there? And actually, if you open up the, the upright piano, you'll see that this is not true. Strings have, they follow the same pattern as the grand piano. They start out really small at the high frequencies, really short. They grow in length until they have no more room. And then the piano builders resort to using the mass of the strings. So basically, what's going on inside the upright piano is very much the same as what's going on inside the, the grand piano. Uh, the sh it's just easier to build a box, you know, it's cheaper. So that's what, why piano builders end up building upright pianos that look like boxes and they don't imitate the shape of the grand piano. That's it. I hope you've learned something interesting and I will see you next time.